Uh, now, when I was at uni, there was a, a game that some people called, uh, played called Assassins. Uh, some of you may know it, but uh, it's a game where a whole load of people uh, sign up and then uh, assign someone uh, to kill, not, not really, obviously, but to kind of pretend kill them, like firing a water gun at them or something like that. And if you get that person, then, then you get their target and, have to, and it, kind of the game goes on. And the, the thing is, the game just is always going on. There's no time limit on it. I've never played it, but I do remember knocking on someone's door just to say hello, and, and, and he, he slowly opened it with, with a cocked elastic band, ready just in case uh, it was uh, an assassin. And, and this guy, was, he was always on high alert uh, for the game. Now, it, it might feel a, l- a little bit ridiculous, that feeling of always being alert, always feeling like you're at war in some way. And, and I reckon we can, we can sometimes feel the same about Christian life, uh, actually, especially here in the West. It feels a bit ridiculous to always feel like there's some kind of war on that we have to be alert for. And we forget the fact that there is a spiritual conflict on. I wonder if our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world perhaps are less likely to forget when I don't know, their minister gets arrested or a Christian friend gets taken by the secret police, but that can seem very distant uh, for us. But here in Esther 3, God's telling us a very old story to wake us up, to, to jolt us out of our apathy, to make us realize we're actually in a conflict. It's not a new conflict, as we'll see. It's an, uh, it's an ongoing one. Now, if you've just joined us in Esther at the moment, the last two chapters have been setting the story. We've nearly had all the main characters, apart from, as I said earlier, Haman, who we meet today. Now, we've, we've seen the king, King Ahasuerus, uh, both extremely powerful in what he can do, and yet always very weak, because he just does what everyone else suggests. We've had the demise of Vashti, his previous queen, the rise of Esther, one of God's people, who's now queen. And lastly, there's Mordecai. Esther's older cousin who who saved the king's life, but sits there unrewarded for his efforts. Perhaps you're wondering, well, what's all this about? Why are we being told about these characters? Where's the story going to go? Well, here in chapter 3, time has moved on. It's about seven years later, perhaps, and that the story is going to take a much darker and life-threatening turn, opening up this story of conflict, of battle, of war. And first thing we're going to see is this. It's the short fuse of the powerful. The short fuse of the powerful. This last character we're introduced to is Haman. And here is the villain. Verse 1, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Abadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who are with him. This is a man second only to the king. A man of power and importance. And let's be honest, he knew it. Uh, and he, because he knew it, he expected to be treated like it. Now, there's no gaining of respect here. Haman hasn't been such a great p- leader. People just love him for it. But if you notice, it's a law, a law to bow down to him and pay homage. And for some reason, Mordecai refuses. Now, the text doesn't tell us why. We're given hints that I'll come to in a moment. But the, the fact they're only hints means the writer isn't pushing us to make a judgment on the rights and wrongs of Mordecai. That's not the focus. What we're meant to see here is the explosive response of Haman, the short fuse of the powerful. Haman is a man with the ego the size of a skyscraper. He is, he is so conceited, he doesn't even notice that Mordecai won't bow down to him. He has to be told about it. You can just picture him kind of swanning through the crowds with his nose in the air, just assuming everyone is bowing down to him. But when he's told, and then he sees it for himself, verse 5, he is filled with fury. Haman's pride has been knocked. The the fragile bubble of his own worth and glory has been burst. If you remember from previous weeks, this empire is all about the visual, the grandeur. So for Haman to be maligned in public, well, that is just not on. Whatever goes on in private, this kind of empire runs on things working in public, on society bowing down to public powers. It's how the empire works. Just think of Nebuchadnezzar, a similar kind of empire in the book of Daniel. He puts up a great statue. Why? So people would publicly bow down and worship it. It's about loyalty to the state. 
and you disobey, well, expect the full force of the empire to come crashing down on you. The short fuse of the powerful. And this gives us a little window into what can happen in society. When someone stands up against the status quo, this is what can happen. And I think we're starting to see more and more of it in our society. You may have felt it personally, perhaps as you've rejected the God of self. You know, a colleague has seen you being sacrificial and helping someone out. Now, some people may uh, speak kindly of that, but they may have, uh, instead of being impressed, they've given you a right earful for it. Why? Because you're not doing things as you should. You're not doing things as they do it putting your, their own promotion first. You're making everyone else look bad. You're not towing the line. Or perhaps it's the God of self now displayed in the, the, the flag of pride and trans right. Now, this is the public God at the moment. We must bow down to the God of freedom. Freedom for individuals to decide who they are in every way, express it however they like with no reference at all to the God of heaven. Display your loyalty to the flag. Virtue signal your allegiance and all, be found, uh, all will be fine. But stand against it and you will face the short fuse of the powerful. Jobs are lost. Twitter vitriol poured out. Names cancelled. Just look at the response to those who aren't Christians. You know, J.K. Rowling, Jermaine Greer, let alone to Christians. Now, M Mordecai, as I've said, isn't necessarily an example of when or how to stand up against the world. Instead, he's an example of what might happen if someone does. I, you know, I doubt Mordecai meant for Haman to decide to kill everyone. Yet, yeah, Haman's, uh, that was Haman's irrational response. That's the short fuse. But I wonder when a fellow Christian does stand up against the world and lights the fuse, I wonder if our temptation is actually to focus on what they've done, not what they're facing. Perhaps we focus on the wisdom of their timing or the, the way they did it. You know, we consume, well, the world's laying into them, they must have done something wrong. Or we can actually wonder, think the opposite as well, they must have done something right. But the short fuse of the powerful isn't necessarily rational. So rather than focusing on the rights and wrongs, let's just remember this is a brother or sister, at the mercy of the powerful, let's stand with them Let's not just assume the worst of them, but show our love to them, knowing this is the nature of the powerful and how they might respond. Even if we think they should have done it in a different way than they did, let's not leave them to face the music on their own. Some guys we know are putting our heads above the parapet at the moment and getting shot at by the, the short fuse powerful. Perhaps they need to know we've got their backs. But God wants us to see what's going on here in a much bigger context to help us gauge this kind of conflict. This might seem like a petty feud between Mordecai and Haman, two guys just uh, not getting on, but actually it's part of something much, much bigger. So it's not just the short fuse of the powerful. We need to see that this is the long burning of the same conflict, the long burning of the same conflict. And the clue of this bigger picture is the way Haman is named. Just go back to verse 1. This is Haman. Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Now, why are we told he's an Agagite? Now, we need to know a bit of our Bible history. Agag was the king of the Amalekites back in the time when Saul was king of Israel. Saul had been commanded to destroy all the Amalekites, but had saved Agag to execute him later. But also remember who Mordecai is. Mordecai is a Benjaminite, like Saul. And he's related to someone called Kish. Well, who's Kish? Well, an important Kish in the Bible was Saul's father. The writer is giving us these details so we start to make connections. This is not just Haman against Mordecai. This is an Agagite against a Benjaminite. This is an Amalekite against a Jew, one of God's covenant people. 
Uh, the Amalekites were, were the long-time enemy of God's people. They were the first nation to try and destroy Israel after the Exodus. And God even promised to Moses there would be war generation after generation between them. But we can go back earlier. This, this conflict didn't just start at Exodus. Actually, this had been burning way before then, right back from Genesis 3. Just remember the curse God put on the serpent. He said, I will put enmity, so not a word we use very often, is it? enmity, that, that's sort of a situation of hostility, war. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right from Genesis 3, a conflict began between the serpent, the devil, Satan himself, and Eve, and her children, and God's people. And that conflict was right there straight away as Cain, in a fit of murder, uh, a rage, murdered his brother Abel. Satan's children striking Eve's children. And here in Esther 3, it's the latest version of the same thing. It's the long burning of the same conflict. Haman's to decision to kill the Jews is not just a historic version of what we'd call anti-Semitism. Now, anti-Semitism is, of course, horrific, should be condemned wherever it is. But what we're seeing here is bigger than that. It's an assault on God's covenant people. In the Old Testament, that was the Jews. And today, after Jesus' coming, it's both Jews and Gentiles united in Christ. And why does this matter? Well, it helps us understand what's going on. This isn't just extreme prejudice on the part of Haman. This is a straight attack on God's people. But it's a straight attack on God's people because it's an attack on their head. Remember that curse to the serpent. Yes, it was about God's people in the plural, but it's also about that because it's about Eve's offspring in the singular, the son of Adam, Jesus Christ himself, the one who would crush the serpent. This is a Christ-centered conflict. So that just helps us look at conflicts with God's people. Just the Pharaohs enslave them, the Amalekites, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians attack them because from them a king would come to rule the nations, the serpent crusher. And here in Esther is just another major attempt to wipe out all of God's people. Why? So the devil could get the king. The serpent is aiming to take out the king of God's people. Get the head and the body dies. Just think how it follows with the intense persecution on Jesus himself. Herod tried to kill him as a child by killing all the small boys in the area. And despite his innocence, the later Herod and the Pharisees did everything possible to get him killed. And the present persecution of the church is still Christ-centered because we are united to the same head. Just think of Jesus' words uh, on, uh, to Saul on the Damascus Road. Saul had been dragging Christians off to prison, and what does Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me? An attack on God's people and what are you doing? You're attacking Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation paints a vivid picture of the dragon and the beast continuing to attack the people of God. Why? Because of their connection to the Son. It's all part of the same conflict. It's a Christ-centered conflict. It's the long burning of the same Christ-centered conflict. They're taking on Jesus, so they attack his people. And Esther chapter 3 just shows the dark nature of the hatred the devil, uh, the devil unleashes through human powers. Firstly, it's murderous. Just look at verse 6. Uh, but Haman was disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, so as they had made note him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, through the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. This has escalated from one man dishonoring another to utter annihilation of a whole people group, and it moved fast. It may feel a bit extreme, but actually we know human history is littered with horrific ethnic fuel retaliation. It's not unusual in our history. 
This was a, a murderous hatred on an unbelievable scale. It was also godless. Haman then cast lots to work out when to do this. This wasn't just a way of shutting your eyes and kind of guessing a day because he didn't want to choose. This was trying to get the will of the gods. He's looking away from the true gods to the gods of the nations for help. It's murderous. It's godless. It's also deceitful. Once Haman has a date, he, he heads in to see the king. And this is such a mixture. I don't know if you notice a vague generalities, half-truths, and lies. It's all mixed in to kind of make sure the king agrees. Verse 8. He never says who it is. Did you see? It's just a certain people. And he says, uh, they don't keep the king's laws. Well, Mordecai didn't keep one, but now it's a sweeping truth of the lot. And finally, he says, it's not in the king's profit to tolerate them. If you just remember what's just happened... Mordecai, a few years earlier, just saved his life. It's utterly deceptive. And just to make sure, Haman throws in a bribe of such extraordinary amount to seal the deal. He has such a deep and raging hatred for God's people, he's willing to do anything to make it happen. And here again, we see the utter passivity and uselessness of King Ahasuerus. He doesn't even ask who the people are. He just goes with what Haman wants. And Haman's murderous plan takes on a fully comprehensive scope. Verse 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to, to kill, to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. It is murderous, godless, deceptive, and comprehensive. No one spared, nothing left. Destroy and kill. Imagine being an Israelite and getting that message. In 11 months' time, that's it the end of you and your people, the terror, the confusion. Verse 15 feels like an understatement. The city of Susa was thrown into confusion. You know, Haman and the king sit down for a quiet, cold beer, and the rest of his empire is in heated uproar. And for the Jews, the timing of this edict was all the more baffling. Verse 12, it says it was written on the 13th of the first month. Two days later, they were about to celebrate Passover. Passover, remembrance of deliverance, a festival remembering God's covenant faithfulness to his people. But here they were in exile with a death sentence sitting over their heads. Had God forgotten them? Had God deserted them? It felt utterly overwhelming. Perhaps this is the feeling and the questions of the, of the church around the world, perhaps the persecuted in, in North Korea or Afghanistan. You know, as well as the, as the short fused powerful unleash their hatred. Where is God in it all? Perhaps you haven't faced this, this kind of murderous persecution, but you have faced the world turn its back on you. Whether your friends have deserted you, colleagues ignored you, job opportunities shut in your face, as we try to do the right thing, we can be thrown into confusion by the response. I know this is a small thing, but I, I still remember a, a guy at uni's unexpectedly angry response at me when I mentioned the CU. Just caught me by surprise. He really hated all that it stood for. But in the face of it, God wants us to remember the bigger picture, the long burning of the same conflict, the same Christ-centered conflict. And it really matters. It matters for two reasons. Firstly, it makes us alert. It makes us alert. Remember, this is focused on Jesus Christ. We walk the path he walked. God's people in the Old Testament, God's people in the New Testament have faced and will face murderous, godless, deceptive, and comprehensive hatred because he faced it. It was the same back with Eve. The, the serpent lied to her. He was deceptive. He ignored God's word. He was godless. He did it to bring death. He was murderous. And he did it to ruin God's people forever. It was comprehensive. It was the same with Jesus Christ. The world turned against him right from the early days of Jesus' ministry. The Pharisees and the Herodians wanted to kill him. They ignored him as God's son and king. They accused him of blasphemy, godless. At his trial, lies just abounded. And they knew, get the king and the rest will disappear. Pilate's weakness is also remarkably like Ahasuerus. And knowing this helps us to be alert with what, uh, to what the devil is up to. It was the same then, and it's the same today. And because his aim is to get rid of Christ and his people, he has two 
key weapons in his armory. He has destruction or assimilation. And they both have that same murderous and comprehensive intent. You know, either you get rid of God's people straight up, especially through fear, forcing them to give in, or you make them so unlike God's people in the end that they just end up rejecting uh, their Savior anyway. Here in chapter 3, we're seeing the first, aren't we? We're seeing the utter destruction and the fear it brings of God's people. And in chapter 4 next week, we'll see an example of the second, Esther, wondering whether just to stay quiet, to just disappear into the crowd. Now, across the world, destruction is a lot easier to see, isn't it? You know, the arrest and execution of Christians in Iran, Afghanistan, North Korea, Nigeria, Somalia, and Libya continues today. The long, burning conflict to get rid of God's people. The devil is on the prowl. But here the war looks different. Here we see it more to assimilation at the moment. Get God's people to be so like the world they cease to be. It's still murderous because it aims to separate us from Christ. And it's fought on lots of fronts. But at the moment, the pressure's really coming from the gay and trans rights issue. Just think of the potential new legislation on banning conversion therapy. There are some really horrible things that people do in the name of conversion therapy that no Christian should ever support. We thoroughly agree they're wicked. But to be honest, they're all outlawed already. This new law would probably use such broad language you'll end up catching Christians in its net because we're will still willing to talk about marriage. We're still willing to talk about what it means to be male and female. And the thing is, this is a gospel issue. Remember, Christ calls us to die to ourselves and to follow him. It's loving, it's for our goods, to convert from our own sinful desires, to live as he wants us to. But this legislation would aim to put the right to express yourself in direct conflict with the right to listen to and obey Christ. It would be slowly just trying to force us to reject Jesus. So it's always the devil's aim. It would be an attempt to force us to toe the line. Just soften your message. That's all you need to do. Just, just merge us into society. The end, uh, in the end, just to get, get rid of any talk of repentance, of conversion. That's the long-term game. That's where the church could head. No repent and believe. Just be true to yourself. And Christ falls from view. But seeing the bigger picture... Well, that makes us alert to the devil's scheme. It's part of the long-burning, Christ-centered conflict. Now, that doesn't mean Christians are perfect and always faultless in this dis discussion. Of course not. We have made many mistakes along the way. But it does mean we shouldn't be naive, just assuming any state legislation is always good for our benefit. Perhaps we've got used to it being so good for so long. We can't imagine something happening here, not in lovely Scotland, but the world is changing. The devil's changing his tactics. We need to be on guard, even as it comes. We stick with Jesus, don't we? Even though the attack is Christ-centered, we stick with him because with him is life and salvation and hope. Even though it brings suffering, we walk with him, his part, his part of righteousness and gentleness and truth. We use his weapons. We use love as we walk a path of sacrifice and suffering. So that's the first thing. Knowing this, this big conflict makes us stay alert. But secondly, it keeps our eyes on the victory. It keeps our eyes on the victory. There's a, there's a hint in this passage that God's people, even in the fear for their lives, were meant to keep their eyes on the victory. Remember, this edict came out at the time of Passover. Just as they hear of death, God reminds them of life and grace and rescue. And for us, knowing there's a, a Christ-centered conflict means we lift our eyes up off our own experience and up onto him. If this is about him, well, where is he? What's happened to him? Well, he sits on his throne of the kingdom. As he died, he actually triumphed over the powers of evil. As he rose again, he dealt the killer blow to his enemies. He is the risen Christ. He's the glorious one who will ride on a white horse and be called faithful and true. Christ has won. He's won. Now, that doesn't mean we don't work in society and in politics. There's still important work to be done in the public sphere. But instead, it means we, we know we're on the winning side. Whatever happens, 
even if they take our lives, we know we are secure in Christ. Even as the storm clouds of persecution close in, there is a shaft of light breaking through. Even as Christ's church might feel at times surrounded by hordes of enemies, there are chinks in their armor. And so we pray, we pray, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We live in a world of the short fuse of the powerful, of the long burning of this conflict. But this conflict is not our conflict, it's Christ's. It's centered on him and he wins. So we stand with him. He's our mighty God. He's wonderful counselor, everlasting father and prince of peace. And as we do, may we be alert to the devil's schemes with our eyes set on the victory to come. Amen.